done for your honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, I hope you have your Bible open to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look through verses 1 through 4, so just a section of what Josh read. Then my wife, uh, when, we, when I was in seminary, I went and uh, did training to prepare to be a pastor and teach God's Word, and, and there was this program offered for the wives of men who were in seminary called Seminary Wives, creative name, I know. And uh, there was a time where they were going to talk about church nursery. And in talking about the nursery or children's ministry in the church, uh, I think they asked something along the lines of what comes to mind when you think of this. And a woman responded with something along the lines, it may not be a direct quote, but it's stuck in my memory, that she said, dirty diapers, runny noses, and bratty kids <laughs> is all that, 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 that was her initial response to thinking about the nursery of the church. And uh, you can tell she just loved children, I think, right? That, that often, this may be what parents think of their task as parenting. It may be what people think when they think of young children is just of the negatives. Dirty diapers, running noses, times when your children are bratty. But I think this passage is going to ha provide instruction for us in a way that, okay, the children in this room can receive instruction and the parents in a, having a spirit-filled family, a spirit-filled relationship in the home and in the family. We've been talking, remember, in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 about the fact that the world is, the world is marked by hostility to God. And because of that hostility with God in our sin, there is division and brokenness in our relationships in the world. The, the, the problems of humanity are symptoms of their problem with God. Because Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, has provided reconciliation with God, he provides grounds for unity in God's people. Those who've been made right with God as dearly loved children are secure in their relationship with God and now have a platform to love other people. My children as dearly loved children walk in the way of love, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And this, this pattern of living as God's new people, Christ's new people, it is not something that we can just lollygag into because the world is actually flowing away from God. There's actually momentum in the world. It's spinning against God. And so Paul says then to them, you need to be not foolish, but wise. You need to be careful and thoughtful. Make the most of your days because the momentum of the world is evil. Don't be drunk, or we could even just talk in general, of self-indulgence and revelry and short-sighted passion-seeking, but be filled with the Spirit. And he unfolds more of that filled with the Spirit ethic in different roles in the home. Spirit filled life doesn't just stop at church. It's not just in this place. It's not just during the worship service. It's designed for the whole, every nook and cranny of your heart and life, actions, thoughts, and emotions. So the question I'd have for you today is what does a spirit-filled child look like? What does a spirit-filled parent look like? A spirit-filled family what, what's that going to look like for us? And my goal is to call the children in here and the parents in here to embrace God's good design for their life. I said that to the husbands and wives. God's good design for your life. To call you to embrace the good design for your family and in that path strengthen our whole community as a church. And here's what I think the, the, the plan is. God, the spirit-filled children, okay, children in here, Every one of you is a child, by the way, I, I would assume. That's how you got here. But the little children in here as well. Children, spiritual children obey their parents in childhood and honor them for life. Spirit-filled children obey their parents in childhood and honor them for life. Spirit-filled parents cultivate their children for God's glory. Spirit-filled parents cultivate children for God's glory. All right? 
So I'm going to unfold this from the passage and, and, and point those things out, all right? Remember, we're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So look at chapter 6, verse 1. The command for children is very simple, okay? Obey your parents to obey the Lord. Obey your parents to obey the Lord. Do you see 6, verse 1? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So little children in here who still live at home, that's what I think, I, I, let me unfold what this means. I think children are described as those people who are still dependent on their parents in the structure that they are in underneath their home and I think being provided for by them, all right? So that takes some discernment in our lives because some of you, uh, for instance, I was in a position where I graduated from college I had a little time before I was going to get married, and I decided, hey, let's save on some rent. My parents said I could live there while I was going to grad school, save up a little money before marriage. I was not dependent on my parents, but you know what? I erred on the side for this passage that I had to obey their rules because I was in their home. I think there's some flexibility here for understanding, though, the fact that financial dependence and provision creates authority. All right, if you are an adult child living in your parents' home, I think you, you should think, I need to obey my parents. And if you want more autonomy, then you need to create less dependence. All right? So just because you don't have a new home as a married person, if you're single, that doesn't make you the child. Now all of a sudden have to obey your parents when you're however old. It means, though, that you may need to take up the responsibility of not depending on them. All right? So let me just say this to anyone who is in that role as children. You're called by God to obey your parents. Not, I'm going to turn this off because I think it's making noise. You're, you're not called to obey your friends. Okay, kids? I don't often take the time to address some of you in here who are that age, but I should. Your friends are not the authority for your life. Your friends' parents are not the authority for your life. It doesn't matter what whoever's mom says functionally what matters is what your parents have said it doesn't matter what is normal all right because everybody thinks that their parents are the weird ones god has called you to obey your parents it's not your desires it's not what you think is fair it's not what other parents are doing in the church you are called to obey your parents obedience should be the rule and Anything else should be the rare, rare, rare exception. Because just like all human authority, I think Paul says, obey your parents in the Lord. This is not some, this is probably as close as it gets in the scripture to a mathematical equation. Whatever your parents say, you do. But it still is something underneath the rule of, of God overall. So we always must obey God rather than men. But let me urge you, little children, parents, all right, often we want to pretend that God says many things that are forceful and clear that, that keep us, my, well, I don't think God told me I could eat that grilled cheese. That is not an accurate application of scripture. If your parents give you a command, you need to recognize it as the authority of God in your life because it's the grace of God to give you that authority. Obedience is expected while you're in the home. <clears throat> so then Paul's going to need to support this command, right? Because here's what he says. In the Lord, for this is right. Support number one is the simple fact that I think Paul's saying this is observed by almost every society throughout humanity as reasonable and appropriate. Children obey their parents. The authority structure flows from top down in the home, from the parents to the children. Now, this is something that often in our day even has been contested by the kind of idea that children somehow come out of the womb knowing better for themselves what they need than their parents do. And let me just quickly say that that's foolish, all right? The Lord has given us ample evidence in, in the book of Proverbs to, and, and throughout Scripture to say that actually our children are not born the way they need to be, where they need to be. They are not able to raise themselves you need to interject parent all right and so here's where he's command he, the expansion command uh the command expands 
because I say obey your parents, and there's only a few of you who are actively living under the authority of your parents right now. But he says, he quotes Deuteronomy, honor your father and mother. Do you see that in verse 2? Honor your father and mother. Everyone, spirit-filled children, are called to obey their parents. And by the way, remember how I said that the, the, the authority structure does not mean that you're less in the eyes of God. It just means you're called to a certain obedience in that role. This is, this is what we're called to do. But every human being is called to continually honor their parents. Honor your father and mother is what Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy tells us. Deuteronomy chapter 5, which is the first commandment with a promise. What does it mean to honor your father and mother? I think it probably is a self-explanatory kind of term, but let, let's unfold it a little bit. Show them lifelong respect. Show them lifelong respect. That means you care for them. They cared for you. And you show them the honor of caring for your parents. One of the ways you care for them may be by listening to them. Do you realize some of you who are younger, eventually you'll get to the point where you don't have to obey your parents. But you should never be at the point where you mute your parents. That is not honor. Right? You, you do not have to agree, but you always, I think, are called to listen. Show them the respect of listening to them. Speak well of them as you're able. If you have nothing good to say, right? The saying, don't say anything. Speak well of your parents. That would be honoring. Venting about your family members, venting about your parents is, is no, no one's saying false flattery. But honoring your parents would be to say, speak well of them. Give other people a healthy picture of the good that they've done because you're alive right now, which is, that means that they've done some things decent, I think. That's uh, the, the, the fact that God has given you the grace of, of parents, you should speak well of them. I also think that Paul would have thought in his co culture context and in our culture context, I think a healthy application of this is that I think you should be expecting to bury your parents. That you should be preparing for that and thinking through the fact that that will involve cost and involve your time and commitment. That you as children, your, your parents brought you into the world and the normal flow of life is that you will account for the cost and responsibility of their exit from the world. Many of you are going to face, or some are already facing, the actual care for your parents that may exceed even the care you receive from them as an infant. My, my grandfather, before he passed, uh, really last year, and, and for about five years before that, was uh, in need of a, a lot of care. And it was care that in many, many ways, to be discreet, mimicked the care for an infant. Um, from careful feeding to uh, all kinds of other things. And I think that that was a tremendous example from, for me, from my parents, of what it looks like to honor their father and mother. I think it was a tremendous thing. Now, some of you, I know circumstances in, in, in your lives, and some of you are facing situations where the best care for a father or mother is long-term, regular medical attention. That may mean that they're not in your home. But I, so I don't, I'm not speaking to you all when I say this. I think our culture is demonstrating a lot of sinful selfishness in how quick we push the eject button on our parents. There are, there's a, the, the world treats elderly people as a, an obstruction and as something that is in the way of my plans and my career and my agenda and my freedom or my comfort. And that is a dangerous, self-centered, and I would say deadly heartbeat in the world. If your parents, God forbid, are in the position where they need medical attention so that a nursing home 
is the most loving thing for them. I'm not trying to bind anyone's conscience and say you can't put someone in a nursing home. But may we all pray long and hard before we start justifying in our heads ways to just kind of get the person out of our way. We need to honor them. Because think of, think of the horror. We have a new baby we welcomed into our home. Of, of our, if our family were to decide that baby Henry was in the way and we decided that we were just going to make somebody else care for him because we really have plans, we wanted to go on a vacation, we wanted to do this or that, right? That, we understand the obligation of a parent to a child, culturally still. We feel that pressure. We say, wait, you can't, you're just going to send them to like a little baby farm where people just kind of take care of them? No. I think the scripture's perspective would be we need to feel that cultural, we need to feel that pressure internally towards our parents. And by the way, I've seen many evidences of God's grace in this congregation of people in here doing those kind of things toward their parents, loving them and caring for them. Praise God for that. Now here's a couple supports for the command still. All right? Which is the first commandment with a promise, he says in the end of verse 2. Now he, he says the first commandment with a promise, and I think what he means is, in, in, in the, the Ten Commandments, the second commandment is given with a general word of, of promise to the nation. But I think this is the first commandment in the Ten Commandments and in the giving of the law that regards an individual who will be blessed for a certain obedience. Right? Th this is along the lines of Proverbs. The first support is that your life will go better in general, if you honor your parents and obey them. See verse 3? So that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I, I, I've thought through this and actually as I studied it out, I, I originally thought maybe this was some kind of veiled um, promise toward the new creation, but I think that this is actually Paul. He's been speaking from the wisdom literature the whole time. I think he's echoing Proverbs in the fact that those who obey and honor their parents will live longer, and live better on this, in this life. They will honor God, and God's built the world in wisdom. So the person, we know this from the book of Proverbs, right? For instance, the person who works hard, in general, will fare better than the sluggard, right? There's nothing inconsistent about this kind of command for Paul to say, listen, if you obey your parents and you honor them, in general, the course of the world, that will turn out well for you. Proverbs 6 says this, verse 20. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Verse 15, 5. A fool spurns the parent's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. Verse 20, 20. If someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. 30, 17. The eye that mocks a father that scorns an aged mother will be pecked out by ravens of the valley and will be eaten by the vultures. Okay, that's a very poetic way to say it ain't going to go well. All right? If you want to end up in Death Valley as a carrion, then scorn your parents. Proverbs 13, 1 says, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a mocker does not respond to rebukes. So here's the temptation in this first half of the passage. We want to consider our parents an exception. We want to consider their, their way that they raised us as the excuse and, and say, well, you don't know my parents. They're crazy. Or this expectation. So young children, in general, in here, any children, this is not the path that God calls you to. Sin always wants you to think you're the exception. But actually... God's word is calling us to realize, actually, there's always pressure around us to believe something other than God's word. Obey what his word has said and trust God to take up your cause if your parents are really unjust. Only when you have explicit, clear commands from God could you potentially be justified in disobeying your parents. Otherwise, even if it's something as day-to-day, -day, right, as turn that off or pick that up or go out and do this, you obey your parents to obey the Lord. That's what we need to realize. It's not like, this doesn't mean that parents can only exercise authority in things that the Bible says. 
I, I think that the, the Bible would give us a picture where God's given us parents not only to teach us God's word, he definitely has given us those, but also to keep us from just getting killed by the stupidity of our youth. So there's no verse on don't put your finger in the light socket, but your parents are allowed to say that and you should obey it because if you don't, it won't go well for you. Oh, yeah. that, that is the way God's word is speaking, That's right? True. So let's continue moving because I think this is a more obvious sin. The, 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 verse, the second half of this passage says, okay, children, obey your parents to obey the Lord. Parents, don't crush your children, cultivate them for God. Okay? Parents, don't crush your children, cultivate them for God. There's a don't and a do. Don't crush your children, do cultivate them. And he says fathers in verse 4. And I think um, this, this, this address is, is well put with fathers as having the chief responsibility for this, but it extends to all parents. So even single mothers in here, this is definitely a command for all of us. Parents, don't crush your children under selfish authority. Look at the words. It says, do not exasperate your children. Some of you may have a translation that says, don't provoke them to wrath or anger. <coughs> Here's the, the thing I want you to, to know. You are, you are ruling out the kind of parenting that is marked by reaction, flare-ups, harsh words, manipulation, insult, sarcasm, nagging, demeaning, right? You're called not to be the kind of parent that if you're, well, let, me, let me back up. If your children are just called to obey you, right? I think God's word is forceful in those first three verses. Obey your parents. So here's, here's what then Paul says. Don't abuse that authority, parents. If your children are expected to obey, then don't be the kind of person who thinks, well, now I've got this little robot that I can, I can abuse with that authority. Cultivate them. Because if a spirit-filled child understands the role of their parents in their life, and they think when they speak, I need to respond, a spirit-filled parent will not be looking and making, crushing them under that authority. Will not be issuing commands in a way that is harsh or sarcastic, nagging, demeaning, inappropriate, teasing, unreasonable demands. Anything else that, that would be provocative. Trying to crush. Because you know what? Many times, parents, you see your sinfulness in the way you are speaking to, responding to, training your children. And so, sometimes you make rules for the sake of making rules. And when you make rules for the sake of making rules, guess what? I think that the scripture would be saying, your children are sinning when they disobey your goofy rules. But a, a, a practical advice from Paul would be maybe... Let's just make good rules so that you can discipline them when they disobey, but you don't find yourself exasperating your children because of unnecessary authority, crushing them under the weight of unrealistic or unreasonable expectations. That is the balance, right? He's speaking to people who have an immense amount of authority by God's providence. They need to wield that, not in a way that extinguishes someone who's expected to obey it. Don't make rules for the sake of rules. Don't wield your authority to get back at your children. Don't take out your frustration and anger on your children. You're mad about something, and now anything your child does, go to your room. Now, if mom or dad are sinfully angry and you get grounded, children, when they say go to your room, you need to obey. And this is that dynamic, right? 
Parents, what you need to do is repent of the kind of sinful heartbeat that would take out your anger on someone else who's under your authority. What you're really doing is mimicking the devil and his way of running the world. Think about the two kings, all right? God is the king of the universe. He creates the universe filled with life, beauty, and goodness, gives Adam and Eve everything, and says, enjoy it under my authority. Pharaoh, a book later, human authority and personified, enslaving people, crushing them, getting unrealistic expectations on their backs, and when they don't meet them, raising the expectations, throwing children into the river, right? Killing, enslaving, and destroying. These are, these are the pictures of authority that you see in the first two books of the Bible. When you rule your home like Pharaoh, it's no wonder that then your children will cry out like the children of Israel. You should be ruling your home like God, a good and loving father who cultivates, who demonstrates real authority, but for the good of those underneath him. Right, it's just a, a helpful picture in your mind of what kind of authority we're talking about. So you don't crush, but you do cultivate. Cultivate your children under representative authority. And here's what I, the reason I say representative authority, because the, the last words of the verse are the ones that I want to talk about first. You build them up in the instruct, training and instruction of the Lord. Of the Lord. Parenting, all right, is a, a representative task. You are not, I was very helped by a man named Paul Tripp on some of these things described in these categories. You are not the owner of your children. God is the one who created and owns all things. He is the, the author of life, and he is the one to, all, to which all of life will be accountable. God is the owner of your children. You are a steward or an ambassador or a representative. Not equal to others. Parents, you have a special place of authority in your children's life. I'm not trying to say that children are just kind of community projects. I'm saying that what it is is often we can begin to treat them like our property. So we try to build our children for our desires instead of the Lord's desires. We want them to reflect our personalities or our interests or our strengths, or in, 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 and we want them to look the way we think is good. And what I'm saying is this. The task is to build them up in training and instruction in the Lord, not to bring them up in the training and instruction of yourself. You don't want to replicate yourself as much as you want to replicate God in his message, his values, his character. You're a representative in your home. Now, what's that going to look like? Okay, that means that you're going to, as an ambassador, not roll in your home as the embassy. You're not going to roll in and just issue willy-nilly commands about whatever you want and think, what do I desire? What's my agenda? You're going to think, what is the king's agenda? What's his message? What is the way he solves problems? What is his purpose? What's his character like? I am representing, because this is the dynamic, okay? Your children are called to obey you as obeying the Lord. So now you're called to be the kind of authority figure that gives a good picture of God. You're called to be fathers, the kind of authority in your home that gives a good taste for authority in your family's life. It gives a good picture because it, it, it is authority that is based on God's message, God's methods, God's character. You are reflecting God. You're representing the Lord. And you're, you're moving them towards the Lord's goal because it says instead bring them up. I want to say this. Your parenting is cultivation towards a goal. It's representative parenting. It's cultivation towards a goal. All right? You're not just surviving. If you get to be a parent and you're not a parent yet, when you get there, it's not just hold down the fort. It is a project with, a, with an end date. All right? 
and, and I specifically mean the time when children are under your, under your authority. You are building them towards something. You're raising them to become their own adults, their own families, leading their own lives under the same God. So think about this. Why, why do I say that? Is that in the passage? Well, yes. Actually, a couple of verses ahead, it says in verse 31 of 5, you, you're, that's why a man will leave his father and mother, right, and cling to his wife. There is a trajectory where your children should, in a healthy world, come out from under your authority and establish their own homes and lives. And you need your children, they are starting under your care, Resurrection Church. The members of our church, anyone here listening, your children start under your care, not where they need to be. They, they are not what they are called to become yet. They are not given yet the information, the capacity, the experience to thrive on their own. So you need to not just hope it happens. Is This is why I'm pausing on this. Is because I think that sometimes in the world we pass for parenting this passive just kind of survive with them in the house for 18 years. Like if we can keep them busy out of our sight or out of our way, if we can manage to keep them entertained while we live too, instead of thinking about a project with a trajectory where we are cultivating by God's grace a human life for the rest of its life, we are outfitting someone to live out from under us. We are building them towards a goal. So parents, let me just ask you this. Have you intentionally planned to raise your children, to build them? Not just to, well, I just survived the next crisis, one thing after another. Have you talked or thought through, if you're a single parent, have you thought through what they need to believe, what they need to value, how they need to act, and then planned real actions and steps to see that happen. You're supposed to bring them up. If I was the coach, I am the coach at Lincoln Park Soccer, Lincoln Park High School, and if the, the school system said, what, what do you hope to accomplish? And I had no idea. And they said, how are you going to accomplish it? And I said, I don't really know. I haven't thought about it. I just, all these players showed up. Now I've got players. I, no, no. I need to understand the game of soccer. I need to think about the game of soccer and the, the real players I have. And then I think, how am I going to help these players through training and coaching and instruction and discipline accomplish the goal that we have? And it's not the same every year when I coach. And we understand that. New players. So you can't take every child and do exactly the same thing. You should look at them and say... How can I take what God has made them and form them to what they must be for his glory? How can they grow in this way? This is no different. By the way, I use the cultivate word because this is no different than all the authority God's given from the beginning. Adam and Eve were put in a world, right? As I, I've said, there were apple trees, but there was no apple pie. Just because they come out of the womb, a beautiful human life doesn't mean that they're where God intends them to be when they're 20. So take that person and take them from apple to apple pie, all right? Cultivate. Work on them, all right? And here's how you cultivate them. Cultivate by training. You see that word? It says, in the training of the Lord. I think this one is the uh, description, maybe more positively, of an active, active instruction. So parents, are you actively shaping your children to know and follow and serve God? This is, this is the side where the day-to-day -day of your life is forming. Often people talk about two types of discipline, formative and corrective. Forming is that you, you instruct and you teach and you direct and you guide. Corrective is, is part of this, this as well, but what it is is you, you actually turn them back from things they've done wrong. We'll talk about that in a second. So you need to be building a way of thinking a set of desires and patterns of behavior that reflect what you think the Lord desires, right? Remember, your representatives in the world. So your little human, he has to submit to God. She has to submit to God in this, in their thoughts, 
their emotions and their behavior, the whole person, right? So you're not instructing them just to do the right things. You should be instructing them to desire the right things. You should be teaching them to think the right thoughts after God. A whole expansive way of seeing, desiring, and living in this world. And, and if I could just um, say a word here about this. This doesn't happen. It, it, ha- it, it happens in all of life. More, they often say, is caught than taught, right? More is caught than taught. You need to teach, but you can't teach only. So when you live in your home and you tell them, hey, lay up your treasure in heaven, not on earth. But then when your, par- when your children see that the thing that causes mom and dad the most conflict is the budget or financial problems or the things that make mom and dad the most excited are material things. You know what you're doing? You're teaching one thing and actually enforcing another thing. At least there will be conflict in their heart. Probably they will pick up on what is subtle and recurring through all of life and value that. If you if you only teach, tell them to be patient, but you never display patience. If you only, let's say, teach them that this world is not our home, but then the way you go about Christmas and the way you structure your vacation time and the way you... It's all built as if this is my best chance to live a good life, not eternity. You will build, over the course of time, through the momentum of your life, people who think this is the best life, right? This, this takes a lot. Of, we could talk through all these things. So, so here's, it could be overwhelming. I don't want to overwhelm us right now with this right now. I just want to say this. Think carefully about the fact that you need to teach your children You need to help them desire, and you need to help them act. So you need some rules, you need some instruction, and I think you need a story or a worldview, a big picture. Because if you celebrate and paint a picture of what is most beautiful and ultimate and where we're headed, what is most desirable, that is different than this world is painting, you will have a much better time with your children seeing your instructions and, and agreeing because they already see the world as going to b- pass away. All right? And, and here, here's where this is coming from in my heart. Every commercial they see is telling them a different story about what satisfies. Every, every friend they have is setting their hopes on their next whatever. Their dad's setting their hope on their next raise. They're setting their hope on their next achievement in life. They're, they're setting their hope on their next material possession. They're building their lives on earth. And it's no wonder then that the children hear this gospel that is built on a future home and they walk away from it. We have to set an atmosphere where the de- defining reality of our children's lives is the word of God and the story he presents. That this world is not eternal, that it will pass away and we will spend eternity with God. He holds the greatest desire, uh, satisfaction. So I'll give a couple suggestions at the end, but one mental framework, if, you, if you're writing, I, I think this is a helpful mental framework because there, at different stages of your life, there are different responsibilities that are primary or central in the cultivation. So from zero, someone told me this, and I can't remember the name now, but it was helpful for me. From zero to five years old, you can think of the C word control. And what that means is you're trying to build some base level human (laughs) self-control. This is a person that doesn't poop in their pants anymore. And it's a person who who does not run into the, the, the parking lot in front of traffic and does listen to authority when it's issued, right? You're, you're getting a lot of the things that I'm dealing with with my children 
are, are at the, the level of I want them to have a framework for then hearing and listening to instruction when they can grasp it because they can't even read yet. You know, they can hear instruction, they can learn it. We're kind of gradually getting there with some of them. But we're trying to gain some human level control in their life. Then from 5 to 12, it matches up well with the way actually school is run. This is a beautiful window to continue to teach control, but to add content. So, so they learn earlier than that. We all know that, like, my daughter's not five yet, and she's learned a lot of things. Judah learns a lot of songs that we've been teaching him. But, but boy, they just continue to grow in their ability to, to learn the story of the Bible, teach them God's word, teach them the stories of the scripture, teach them what God desires and what he's like and what his word says. Just load them with the content of God's word. And then at around age 12, we understand these, these numbers are fluid, right? But around age 12, there is this natural changing of a person that starts to take on their own energy. And so what I would, I would recommend is to make sure that you don't just throw content, but you start to press in to figure out if they're, if they're convinced, conviction, right? Are they grasping on to the truths that they have been taught? Are they seeing the world the way that you are teaching them to see the world? and actually believing it for themselves. And then, after 18, then you could use the C word, counsel. You're no longer in control. You're no longer setting the worldview framework for them. Now, you're a voice, an important voice, but a voice among many. And you always want to be there to speak into your children's lives and help them walk through life wisely. That's, that's a, been a helpful framework for me. So let's... Are you spending time with, listening to, caring for your children? Are you cultivating them? Do they have enough of your priority to get that from you? You also need to cultivate by training, but then look at it, it says, and instruction. I really wish they kept the word admonition, admonishing. It's a translation, because I think the second word is something in the lines of, uh, of, of corrective. Parents are to actively combat and counteract the sinful drive in your children, and the sinful momentum of the world. So the Bible teaches us that people come out of the womb not where they need to be. In fact, sinful and, and marked by hostility with God. That's our default setting of the human heart. And that's why Proverbs says this, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. If you hate your children, you'll let them raise themselves. Free-range parenting is is foolish okay if you hate your children then you'll let them decide what's best for themselves god gave you or gave them you why like it, it, it is it is crazy for us to think that that we should just kind of let our our children raise themselves functionally by only stopping them when they're about to kill themselves but letting their desires and actions shape themselves we must be active to combat the fact that they're born sinners in a sin-filled world and walk wisely. So parents, here's something that I think is important because I just talked about like a framework for seeing your children and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's the idea of Christians that's very common and I think, I hope I don't speak about it in a misrepresentative way, but about like grace-filled parenting. And I think grace-filled parenting is a very, the idea of grace in parenting is needed. We were given grace, okay? But there's, a, uh, in my mind, a mutation and a problem with this idea that grace-filled parenting means authority-less parenting, that you just basically don't have rules because you're full of grace. You know, your, your grace-filled parenting is kind of like, hey, I don't ever discipline my children or tell them something's wrong or come down on them for doing something wrong. God showed me grace when I was a sinner, so I just never, never punish them for their wrongdoing. And if I, could just, if I could just push back, I think helpfully from some counseling and teaching I was given, uh, I thought it was very helpful to, to highlight this. There is a difference between law and grace. You cannot be saved by law. You cannot obey your way into the kingdom. Your children cannot... If you run them through all the instruction and all these teachings, just save themselves. There's no guarantee that they will just come out the way they have to because there's a spiritual inability that you need the Spirit of God to change, right? 
But if you embrace lawless parenting, where there's no hard and fast authority, there's no line in the sand where you tell children, if you cross it, there will be hard consequences. You will actually unplug the plan God has given you. What did God give the law for? Did God give the Old Testament law to give people an opportunity to save themselves? No, what did he do? He exposed sin through it. So if you create a grace-filled parenting that gives no hard and fast authority, your children will never see their need for a savior. They'll never see their inability. They will never understand the fact that they're broken because they are not in rebellion when they're their own king. So it's really unhelpful for us to think about law parenting and grace parenting by, by, by enforcing kind of on top of it this idea that we don't give authority. No, no, the, the law and grace are helpful distinctions in the fact that we cannot work our way to righteousness, neither can your children. But in our daily lives, Jesus didn't call us to lawlessness. We're now under the law of Christ, right? So here's what we think of it as this. The law, all right, and I'm using the law as authority in, from God's word, all right? The law is grace. Do you realize that? Grace in the place of grace already given is the way John says it. When Jesus came and replaced Moses, grace in the place of grace already given. Do you know why the law is grace? Because you can't, as this is what uh, uh, Tripp said, and I wrote it down because it was so helpful, you can't grieve what you don't see, and you can't confess what you don't grieve, and you can't seek help for what you haven't confessed. So think about this. Your children, if they have no line in the sand, will never know they've crossed the line. They'll never turn from crossing the line, and they'll never find a savior because they've never turned. You see that? If we don't bring authority into our children's lives, and they don't come into conflict with that authority because they inevitably will as sinners, they will never find the savior. It's not that they don't actually have a law. God has expectations for their holiness. But they need, by your graceful parenting, to see the fact that they're not meeting the expectations of a holy God. And so when you tell them don't put their finger in the light socket, it's not merely life preservation. It's also the fact that they are starting to see the sinfulness of their own heart, the engine running a different way. So, so let me just say something to the side here. Parents, this is why you, you use your authority wisely as a representative of the Lord. Because my wife and I have had this talk a couple times, where if you just issue a command, here's, I really think the Bible would be pushing you to say, now if they disobey your stupid command, you need to enforce the punishment because they disobeyed the authority God's given them. It'd be helpful to reduce the stupid commands, right? Because what you really need more, my father told me this many times, more than you need to keep them from biting their fingernails or picking their nose or whatever, you need them to understand the biblical place for authority in their life. The authority of God, the authority of his word, the other practical human authorities that God places. And so if you cultivate this place where dad issues a bunch of useless commands and then never follows through when they break them, because, well, I shouldn't have really said don't touch that. Well, if you say don't touch that, you need to think, I am not loving that child by letting him touch it without punishment. Because you are building in him a casual taste for authority instead of a respect for the fact that God puts legitimate authority in the places in our lives that we are called to obey and submit to. So, for parents, don't just issue dumb commands, like don't touch whatever if they can touch it, right? But also... Be faithful and diligent to follow it. And I, and I'm, I was rebuked thinking about this again because I try to keep it up. We try to keep it up. But it's, it's, a, it's a, a daunting, continual task. So <coughs> let me just say this. You're called to cultivate your children. You are not in a math problem in life. You actually, parents, need to remember this. You are unable. You are unable to save your children through your parenting. You don't have the ability. Because now I'm telling you, all the children in here, obey your parents. And some of them may go, oh, you don't understand my parents. And your heart cries out. Or honor your parents. And your heart cries out, how am I going to do this? And I'm telling parents, raise your children 
for the Lord, not selfishly, not trying to build in them the athlete or educator or, or business person success that you want, but the traits that the Lord calls for and the kind of person. But guess what? Only the Holy Spirit can breathe in them new spiritual life and transform them from dead to alive. Only the Holy Spirit can actually make them like Jesus Christ, and that is your goal, but you are dependent in it. You're an active player in a role that you can't accomplish, all right? That's attention. You're, you're called to fulfill your role, much like evangelism. Proclaim Christ. Can't actually save anybody. You have to have God save them. Parents, diligently parent and lean on the Spirit to, to make the gospel sink into the heart. Okay? So what's your hope if you can't do this? Call out to the Savior and lean on the ways that the Savior has given you to succeed. The Word, prayer, and God's people. Keep giving your children the Bible. Family worship. I'd recommend any of you, you want to know what more about that? Fathers, you should be reading your Bible out loud to your families at a regular <clears throat> pace. If you need coaching on how that looks, then I'm happy to walk through it with you. But let me just say this. You need, you should be taking the opportunity to read the Bible to your family on a regular pace, whether that's once a week, whatever. You need to make a time to make sure that they're getting God's word from you. Cultivate your family and your children. You need to pray for your children and call on the Holy Spirit to build in them these things. And one of the simplest ways for me was I just took the, the, the fruit of the Spirit and I uh, would often, when I lean into Judah's crib or Charlie's crib, or now Henry, he's not in the crib, he is in the bassinet, but with the other kids when I tuck them in, and I'll spend a ton of time like all over, praying all over. Often I'll just, right next to their ear, ask the Lord to give them the Spirit and build, them in, build in them one of the fruit of the Spirit. Please make Judah a gentle man. Please like make Charlie a self-controlled man by the power of your, a woman by the power of your spirit, right? Just building these things. Because you know what? Sometimes, and I do pray for them in concerted times. Like I actually sit down and pray for them or kneel and pray for them. But I just want to every day make sure I'm just thinking of these things. And I hope by the time they're old enough to rem hear my prayers, they know these are the things I want to see God make them. More than a, a successful whatever. Gentle, patient, loving, right? Building these things. And make God's people an asset to your, you know, a strength. Get them in worship. Get them here to sing and learn the songs and enjoy the people and get them in fellowship. Host people in your home and go to other people's homes and get your children rubbing shoulders with people who value these things. It will create for them a, a world, uh, it will enforce the worldview you're teaching. Because... I'm getting on rabbit trails here, but I want you to, if your children think that your family is the weird only ones that believe this, there is a high degree of pressure for them to walk away. But if they are a part of a community of people so that, sure, they go to a public school or they go to a school where a lot of people don't believe this, but they've got a bunch of people in their lives and other kids even their age whose parents are saying the same kind of commands, telling the world run this really this way, that God's word really is true, it will help them by God's grace see that this is real. The, the people of God are fleshing it out for them to see, oh, my parents aren't the only ones, like we're in some random weird thing. We're the only ones who like that. God's given you the grace of a living color demonstration of the fact that it's real. Lean into that. And persevere. Embrace the patient process over a lifetime. All right? That is something I need. Spirit-filled children will obey their parents in childhood and honor them for life. Spirit-filled parents will cultivate their children for God's glory. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us grace to honor you in, in our uh, parenting. There's a lot of things that, that we could talk about, and I've probably dropped a lot of at least momentary uh, hints at, at different things that we could talk through more. Lord, would you just help us to remember that we are dependent? There's no math equation 
we are called to raise these children and children are called to obey their parents for you and in your glory. But Lord, then we're also sinful people who need your Holy Spirit to help us to do this. It's in Jesus' name that we call out for strength and help. Amen. All right, the worship musicians are going to come up. And we're going to take a time, a special time that I hope is it's common to our experience here as a congregation, but needs to be, it needs to be special every time we pause to, to remember the Lord's Supper and, and remember the, the Lord's death on our behalf. The Lord's table here, the Lord's Supper, it has two elements. I say these often. But the bread, representing the broken body, and the cup, representing the shared, the spilled blood of Jesus Christ for our sins. It is a, a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus. And then there's the added significance of the fact that it is a picture, as we share together, of our unity in him, with him as our hope. So this element is significant for you, for you remembering your salvation. And this process of us observing it together is helpful for you in sharing in Christ as a community of believers. It's a proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes. Now, because we do this and we regard it as both a thing, an expression of our relationship to the Lord and our relationship together, we observe the Lord's table it, it, as a expression of our membership in the church. So if you are a member of our church, we ask that when the music begins, when we sing, you would come up the middle aisle and receive the elements and then go back to your seat out the exit aisles there on the sides. If you're not a member of our church, uh, we do not regard ourselves as the only Christians in the world. We are one church of many who love and follow the Lord Jesus. But we understand this as an accountability. So if you would like to join our church, you'd like to talk more about uh, uh, partnership and walking with us together, then come talk to me afterwards. If you don't know Christ, or if you're not a member of our church, I'd ask you to just refrain from taking this element, though, during this time. All right? So let's begin singing, Behold the Lamb. Go ahead and stand with us. Our sins away Oh! 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. I want us to take a second, <coughs> quietly bow our heads and contemplate what the Lord has done for us. I will read verse 26 in a moment to end that, and then we have one more verse from that song. We'll go straight into that verse after I read. So let's take a second and think about the fact that the Lord has died for us and risen again on our behalf. Each of us would be trapped by our sin, condemned eternally without the death of the Lord Jesus. Each of us would be marked by our shame for, and our guilt. We would be continuing in our fear and hostility towards each other. Division be, that springs from our division with God. But because of Jesus, who lived perfectly and died sacrificially, we can be made right with God. And that's why we pro whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 9. In fact, it's a, a verse that teaches us, parents, describe some of your responsibility. These are the commands and decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today to, are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Tell your children, right, the words of God have, have filled your heart so much that they are pressing into all of your life and all over them, right? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us grace. Lord Jesus, I, I know that, uh, that there's so much more that needs to be said and probably things that need to be said a lot more clearly. Would you help us to, to walk out the, the... It's a difficult task, a sin-revealing task in ourselves uh, to parents, to... To, to honor our parents. So would you give us grace for that, Lord Jesus? We are not going to parent or honor our parents to get into the kingdom. We are going to honor our parents and parent by your grace because you have brought us into the kingdom of, your, of light. It's in Christ's name that we have been brought in. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and have a good Sunday. If you are serving in LP teams tonight, could you come to the front and connect with me, by the way?
And that would be, it would make sense that then they need to follow your authority, right? Yeah, but it's kind of stressful at times. It's like, hey, Luke, yeah. Luke, Luke, no. Even though one's, one's 14, one's 12, and one's 9. 